uh, to Eddie as well, even though he's not here. Eddie is um, Skyping in. Did you say he was? No, he's not. Uh, so I think I have about an hour to speak, and I may go slightly under that. Uh, so I know this is the Foundations of Probability Seminar, and the, the talk is really a talk in the philosophy of biology, but uh, involving some issues to do with probability, especially the role of uh, probability in understanding the nature of fitness in the biological sense. And uh, what I'm going to do uh, is asked this question that philosophers has, have asked about fitness, namely, what is it? How should we understand the nature of fitness? And I'll begin by uh, pointing out that the question is a non-trivial one. You might think, well, if you want to know what fitness is, just open a biology textbook and read uh, the definition of fitness as, as biologists deploy it. Uh, but actually, if you do that, what you see is that there's an enormous amount of variation in biology textbooks, uh, not just textbooks, but biology um, more generally. Fitness is introduced in different ways, defined in different ways. Uh, so uh, one question to ask is, is, is any of these definitions the, the correct one or the most fundamental one? And some of that variation is uh, not that interesting. It just reflects uh, different concepts of fitness, all of which are compatible with one another. So for example, the, there's a distinction sometimes drawn between short-term fitness or next generation fitness uh, on the one hand, and long-term fitness, fitness um, down further generations or maybe in the infinite limit, something like that on the other hand. You also have distinctions between absolute fitness and relative fitness. Absolute fitness is roughly the total number of offspring uh, uh, you produce and relative fitness is that total number normalized against the population average. Um, those kinds of differences are, are benign. Uh, but there is some genuine disagreement it, both uh, in biology and in philosophy about how fitness should be understood. That's very interesting because you, you get uh, different definitions of fitness which are alleged to be the correct one to figure in uh, a very general statement of the conditions required for evolution by natural selection. So often in, in biology and also in philosophy, f what philosophers try to do is uh, write down a specification of a maximally general kind of what conditions are required for natural selection to occur. And often in the specification of those conditions, fitness is used as one of the concepts in the definition. And different people write those conditions down in different ways. They employ different definitions of fitness. And uh, so it's interesting to work out which of those is correct. And uh, moreover, uh, when you look at these definitions, uh, nearly all of them, it's fair to say that nearly all of them, if not all of them that have been written down, are wrong. That is, all of them are subject to counterexamples of various kinds. And I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, one kind of counterexample today uh, with respect to one uh, definition of fitness that's been used. So, so that's ultimately the, the question that I'm interested in, what is fitness? And uh, there are sort of roughly two kinds of answer that have been given uh, to the question. The first kind of answer is the idea that fitness is unified. That is, that there is a single definition of fitness and that can be specified from which all of the other legitimate fitness concepts can be derived and which can figure in one of these specifications of the conditions required for natural selection to occur. So the attempt to write down a definition of this kind is, has been sort of the, I guess, the holy grail of, in philosophy of biology when it's come uh, to the question of understanding the nature of fitness. But recently, in the face of uh, the realization that there's a proliferation of different fitness measures used in biological theory, uh, some philosophers have started to argue that there, in fact, is no single definition of fitness that can be given. That is, that fitness is disunified. And there's a nice expression of this view in Peter Godfrey Smith's book, Darwinian Populations and Natural Selection, from a couple years back. He's, he writes, it's better to say instead, better, better than saying there's a single definition, to say that there is a family of fitness-like or fitness-related properties, all involving reproductive output in some sense or other, 
different ones are relevant in different circumstances. And this shows up in the diverse fitness-related properties seen in different formal models. So Godfrey Smith thinks maybe there is nothing in common to these various fitness measures that you see in biological theory, apart from the fact that they all have something to do with predicting uh, reproductive output. Um, OK, so what I want to do in this uh, talk today is to take one common definition of fitness that has some claim to being the received view of fitness in the philosophy of biology and show by presenting a couple models that involve variance in reproductive output uh, that that definition fails. And th that part of the talk is something where I'm just sort of repeating uh, other things people have said. Uh, but I'm going to argue on the basis of these cases that we should actually reject a common assumption that's made uh, by both biologists and philosophers about the relationship between the fitness of individuals and the fitness of types. And I'll pause there and just say that what I mean by that is you can think of uh, the, the kinds of populations that we're talking about as being populations of individuals. The individuals have various characteristics. Uh, they instantiate various types, um, it's, or what biologists sometimes call traits. And so fitnesses can be ascribed to two different things in these populations. You can talk about the fitness of an individual, and that's got something to do with how many offspring that that individual will produce. Uh, or you can talk about the fitness of a type in a population, right? The fitness of a particular trait. I'm going to use the, the term type for that. And that there's, there's presumably some kind of relationship between these two things. And as I'll um, suggest, there's a, a, a very common assumption is that the fitness of individuals is basic and the fitness of types somehow derives from the fitnesses of individuals. Uh, I'm going to suggest that that is uh, false. So the fitness of an individual is that it can be measured as the, the number of offspring. Okay. Well, it's got something, something to do with the number of offspring. Okay. So yeah. I'm I'll, I'll, what you would describe the fitness of a trade as, for whether it's related. To that That's got something to do with the number of offspring that the individuals bearing that trait have. But I'm not going to be more precise than that at the moment. Yeah. I just want to make clear the distinction between the fitness of individuals and the fitness of types, right? You quoted Dr. Smith. Is this an elaboration of his book, or do you disagree with his book? I'm going to remain neutral on that question, although I'll suggest that at least the cases I talk about don't give us an argument for this disunified claim that, that he makes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, go through some historical background on the concept of fitness. Uh, second of all, introduce this uh, propensity interpretation of fitness, which is, has some claim to being the received view of fitness in philosophy of biology. Uh, third of all, present these models which involve one way or the other variance and reproductive success. And uh, in the final section, argue that uh, the, the lesson to be drawn from these cases is that uh, the fitness of a type is not, cannot be reduced to or does not uh, exclusively depend on the fitnesses of individuals, and finally conclude. Uh, so to start with some historical background. Uh, so the term fitness isn't really in Darwin. It, in fact, in the first edition, it only appears once, that term, fitness. Uh, there are lots of cognates of the term which do appear, the term fit, the term fitted. Um, but it's very clear that in all, in all uses of the term in Darwin, fit means literally uh, the fit between an organism and environment. So it's used in a way which makes the, the notion of fitness equivalent to the notion of adaptedness or being adapted to particular environmental conditions. Um, uh, so that's why the term is used, fit, fit like fit your hand in a glove. Since then, however, and this is a, a little uh, uh, graph showing you the different terms that Darwin uses. He uses fitness only once, fit twice, but this term fitted 31 times. It's really about the relationship between the organism and, and the environment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, at the time of the modern synthesis at the beginning of the 20th century, when genetics and evolutionary theory got put together, uh, 
Population geneticists started using fitness, the term fitness in a different sense. And the first use of this was in the, the great uh, work of population genetics, um, Fisher's The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection from 1930. And Fisher sometimes uses the term fitness in Darwin's sense to refer to fit with an environment, but most frequently he, he uses it instead to refer to the, uh, a quantity that predicts the relative rate of change of a type in a population. Uh, so that's a different use of the term. And just to give you uh, two quotes which, which exhibit these differences, so the first quote is from Darwin. This is the, single use, the, the first and only use of the term fitness in Darwin. So Darwin says, nor ought we mo to marvel if all the contrivances in nature be not, as far as we can judge, absolutely perfect, and if some of them be abhorrent to our ideas of fitness, right? our ideas of what traits would make you um, well equipped to cope with your environment. Uh, <laughs> Uh, following it is the first use of the term fitness in Fisher. Uh, it's really just the first part of this that's important. He's saying, since M, this quantity he's introduced, measures fitness to, to survive by the objective fact of representation in future generations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the crucial point here is that um, Fisher is using uh, these fitness measures as quantities that predict the representation of a type in the population in the future. It's got nothing to do with relationship between organism environment and everything to do with predicting the way that the trait will change through time. You look like you want to... Just like a preliminary question. I guess is Fisher's sense maybe relative to an environment? Like um, predicting how a population will change seems like uh, it's going to be, I don't know, not independent of questions about, uh, yeah, how it's environmentally situated. Right, or that's... Different possible ways that Right, so that's a natural thought and it's one that, um, as I'll explain, the propensity interpretation tries to sort of uh, formalize in a, in a way. Um, a natural thought is that it's got the fact that certain traits will increase their representation in future has something to do with how fitted they are in Darwin's sense to the environment, uh, but it's complicated, as you'll see. Um, what I want to point out is simply that the, the fitness has these sort of two aspects to it. Um, first, the ecological sense that Darwin introduced, and second of all, this uh, more mathematical sense that Fisher introduced. Uh, these are what Sober calls the two faces of fitness. He puts it succinctly by saying fitness is both an ecological descriptor and a mathematical predictor. Uh, now, the propensity interpretation, one way of understanding the propensity interpretation of fitness is as a, a theory of what fitness is that is supposed to sort of um, pay respect to both of these dimensions of fitness. According to the propensity interpretation, and I should say that um, lots of different things get called the propensity interpretation. So my, my definition of it here is somewhat stipulative. Um, it was initially proposed in the late 70s in two papers by philosophers, the philosopher Robert Brandon in 78 and uh, Susan Mills and John Beattie in 1979. And uh, these conditions that I'm writing down are, are my way of stating what the theory is that disentangles a couple theses that are uh, in fact independent of each other, but all of which are, are committed to by both authors. So uh, I think the, the propensity interpretation is best thought of as the conjunction of these four theses. So the first one is just the cl a claim about what kind of property fitness is. And the, the claim is that fitness is a propensity, that is a probabilistic disposition. Um, that's what fitness is, metaphysically speaking. Uh, the second claim is that uh, this propensity has a single measure. So there's some single way of uh, characterizing the propensity that fitness is. And the third claim is that the, the particular characterization that is appropriate is uh, the expected offspring number. So that is, in particular, the absolute fitness of a particular organism or individual relative to a particular environment is that quantity, which is just the uh, weighted sum of the different possible numbers of offspring the organism might have. Um, where the weights are just the probability of the organism having that many offspring. Uh, so that's the, the proposal for the single measure of what fitness is for a particular organism with respect to a particular environment. Uh, 
And the fourth claim is the claim that the fitnesses, all other fitnesses can be derived from this one. And in particular, uh, what I'll call priority, that the fitness of types is grounded in the fitnesses of individuals of that type. Uh, so that the primary bearer of fitness in this theory are individuals, and the measure we give is the, um, the expected offspring number. And then we get the fitness of types by, um, uh, as, as you'll see, averaging across the fitnesses of all the individuals of that type. Right, so my particular cat has a certain fitness. Yeah. Since he's been altered, it's zero. So. <laughs> right. right. So this number three, uh, does this have any relationship to tissue infection? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, Fisher, in the first instance, was not thinking about the fitnesses of individuals. He was thinking about the fitnesses of types and sort of theorizing directly in terms of those. So that is, he was, he was talking about the fitnesses of genes, but he wasn't thinking of the fitnesses of particular individual genes, but rather the fitnesses of a certain genotype uh, in a population. Uh, and so I, the, ans the answer is, um, no, in that he didn't deal directly with individual fitnesses. That quotation you had seemed to have something to do with variance rather than with expectation. Uh, yeah, the second part does. Yeah. I'm going to be talking about variance a lot in, in what follows. Yeah, so there's a good question about whether. Um, there's a good question about whether on Fisher's definition, the, the type fitness that you would get by extracting from these individual fitnesses would yield the quantities that Fisher is uh, using in, in his theory. Uh, so let me talk just a little bit more about uh, priority. Uh, I mean something very specific by priority, namely uh, what you can think of as a supervenience thesis of the fitness of types on the fitness of individuals of that type. Uh, it's obviously the, the case that the fitness of a type is somehow grounded in the collective reproductive behavior of all of the individuals of that type. It's not as if the fitness of types in a population is something that sort of floats free of what the individuals of the type do. Uh, but priority expresses a more specific claim than that, in particular that the fitness of a type is grounded in the fitnesses of the individuals of that type. That is, that the fitness of a type somehow supervenes on the fitnesses of all of the individuals the of that type. The fitness of individuals varies over time, presumably. Uh, yep. And so, is that, so is it a particular time that the fitness of the type? Yeah, you can understand, I mean, you can understand this quantity uh, here, this, this weighted average, as being indexed to a time in two ways. First of all, that it's describing the fitness of the organism at some particular time, but it's also indexed to the expected number of offspring for some particular time in the future. So there's really two suppressed time indexes in, in, that, in that expression. Um, and since fitnesses are numbers, uh, what this priority claim means is that there must be some mathematical function from the fitnesses of individuals to the fitness of the type. And the one that the propensity theory uses is the idea that it's just the average. So the idea is that the absolute fitness of a type is just the average of the absolute fitnesses of all of the individuals of that type. Right? So you want to know what the fitness of um, you know, having a particular height is in the population. Well, that's just the average of the fitnesses of all of the individuals in the population that bear that height. Where by those fitnesses, we mean uh, fitnesses as measured by this quantity, expected offspring number for all of those individuals. They will vary from one another, and the fitness of the type just is the average of all of those. Uh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's badly formulated. It, it oh. is just I. Oh, it yeah, is just I. it is okay. just I. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, so this is, I mean, for all of the possible offspring numbers that the individual might have, you sum them weighting by the probability of the organism having that many offspring. Yeah. Uh, so the propensity interpretation uh, was very popular because um, for one reason is that it sort of unifies these two dimensions of fitness. You can understand these uh, propensities as uh, reflecting the relationship between individuals and their environment, uh, but also being mathematically describable and hence have something, having something to do with the capacity to predict how, the, how a population of those things will evolve through time. It also had some claim to disentangle the uh, relationship between the actual number of offspring an individual has and the uh, quantity fitness, which is supposed to explain that. It, it says fitness is not identical to how many offspring you actually have. It's identical with the propensity to have a, a particular number of offspring. And so maybe fitness can serve in evolutionary explanations, contra Popper and other critics of evolutionary theory. It helps you distinguish outcomes due to selection and due to chance on the basis of whether the offspring number that some individual had reflect was an expression of the propensity or not. Um, you can see easily how to define different fitness concepts, so um, long-term versus short-term, absolute versus relative. And it entails that fitness is unified. And so this definition of fitness do, would let you, in principle, write down the basis for a general account of the conditions required for selection occur, to occur. You just require that there's types in a population with different fitness in this sense. So the, so the theory had many attractions, but uh, it also has problems. And what I want to do is present two cases which show that at least um, one aspect of the propensity interpretation is definitely false. Uh, so I'm now going to talk about cases involving variance and reproductive success. Uh, the first case involves what uh, biologists sometimes call between-generation variance. So this is uh, a case in which you've got uh, at least two types in your population, and there's variation in the, the number of offspring produced by at least one of these types. But the variation is such that uh, for any particular generation, the number of offspring had by the individuals of that type is the same. So all of the variation is, it occurs generation to generation. So to take a, a, a very, very simple example where you have uh, two, a, two individuals of type A and two other individuals of type B, you can suppose that the A individuals have, uh, always have two offspring whereas the B individuals have a 50-50 chance of either having one offspring or three offspring. Uh, but on, for any particular generation, the B individuals either all have one offspring or all have three offspring. So the variance is so that they're sort of reproducing in lockstep, if you like. They're, they're perfectly correlated with each other uh, with respect to uh, the number of offspring they have. Uh, so in a case like that, uh, you can calculate the um, both the expected offspring number and the expected frequency, and the calculations are very simple. You can see the expected offspring number is the same, right? It's two for, uh, or four total for the population uh, for both of them, two per individual. Uh, but the expected frequency is different. The A type is either going, has a 50-50 chance of contributing four individuals to a population of six uh, on the one hand, or, and a 50 50% uh, chance of contributing four individuals to a population of 10, right? So the first case is the case in which the B individuals uh, each have one offspring. The second case is the, the case in which the B individuals all have three offspring. Uh, so the expected frequency uh, is greater than 50%, and uh, the expected frequency of B li likewise is less than 50%. Um, so you can see that the... Uh, you can have two individuals that have the same expected offspring number, but the expected frequency of the types in the population is different. And the biologist uh, or the population geneticist John Gillespie wrote a paper about uh, these kinds of cases and uh, derived a measure of fitness, a general measure of fitness, which took account of both the expected offspring number and the variance. So the, the fitness of A in this case is measured by the uh, expected offspring number corrected by 
this uh, corrected by the variance. And so you can see the higher the variance, the, uh, the lower the fitness, right? So there's two ways to increase fitness. You can increase your expected offspring number, or you can uh, decrease your variance. Yeah? Right, that's exactly right. So that expression just is an approximation to the geometric mean. That's right. That's is, right. Is this frequency, is that just for the first generation? Or, I mean, the, you, you would only have this. That's just, that, that's right. That's just for the first generation. Okay. Yeah. But that's, yeah. What, that's what the definition of, so of expected frequency is, or you're just defining this as the expected frequency of this what, second? I'm just saying the expected frequency for the first generation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's the case of between generation variants. Uh, there's also uh, what biologists call within generation variants, and it's exactly the same except now we let the, uh, the, the, the type that has variance in reproduction, we let the individuals vary independently of one another so that the information that one of them had a certain number of offspring doesn't give you any information about the others of the type, how many offspring they have. Uh, and Gillespie considered this case. Uh, you can, again, consider it with the same numbers as the first example I gave. We've got the A types always have one offspring. The, the B types have a 50-50 chance of either having one or three, but those are all independent of each other now. So again, you can perform a simple calculation to see that the uh, expected offspring number is the same, but the expected frequency is different. You'll notice that the, uh, the expected frequency advantage of the A type in this case is less than the expected frequency advantage of the A type in the case of between generation variants. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a general feature of these kinds of cases. And the, again, Gillespie wrote down a, a measure of fitness for these cases, which covers the, the general case. And in this expression, you have the expected offspring number, the variance, but also a parameter n, which represents population size. Uh, and I'll be coming back to that population size parameter uh, as we go along. So I'm wondering if, the, um, if you were to take this to the second generation, third, and so mm -hmm. on, so would, or, uh, would these calculations be converging to some? Do you know what, what these expected frequencies might be? What the long-range expected frequency yeah. is? Um, let me think for a moment. I think, in, I think, although I, I'm not completely sure, I think in both cases, the, the, the sort of in the long run, in these examples, the, the, the expected frequency of A would be 1 and B would be 0. Okay, so yeah. then that would give uh, kind of credence to this idea that A is more Right. right, right. I guess what I was trying to, you know, since you started with certain initial conditions, it could be that this calculation depends on that. Right, 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 uh, right, right, right. Um, although even if you just focus on the single generation change and focus on whether A is fitter than B with respect to the next generation, the fact that the frequency of A goes up Right, if you're saying By, is it enough. always goes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, nice. yeah. So it's sort of fitter both in the short term and in the long term, uh, in both cases. Yeah. Uh, and in th these are sort of two, two cases on a whole spectrum of different possibilities. And some, in some of the other cases you talk about, there is a dependence on the initial state for what happens. And there's also, it, in some of these cases, um, there are random elements to whether one type goes to fixation or not. And, those, and, and what the probabilities are can depend on where the population starts as well. But in these two cases, I think it, um, those factors don't come into play. Uh, so one th what can we conclude from these cases? Uh, it's one thing that's very clear that we should conclude is that um, this measure of fitness that the propensity theory gives is false, because the measure said that uh, fitness just has to do with expected offspring number. But these cases show that uh, 
uh, there can be fitness differences between types in a population, even when expected offspring numbers is, is the same, in the, the difference being driven by the difference in variance. So expected offspring number is one factor that can contribute to the fitness of a type, but variance is another factor that can contribute. And the standard way that the defenders of the propensity interpretation have reacted is by saying that uh, that's the only problem with the theory. They say, uh, and here are two quotes to illustrate this, Richardson and Burian write, we view this, these problems with variance, as a problem concerning the appropriate measure of fitness, not its definition. Right? Maybe we just need to write some more general expression that takes variance into account. Uh, likewise, Pence and Ramsey in a recent paper say these counterexamples, the ones like I just described, are problems not with the propensity interpretation itself, but with the various mathematical models of it which have been proposed. So the idea is basically, look, well, we wrote down the wrong mathematical uh, measure uh, when when we gave the theory, but we just need to find some appropriately generalized measure and plug that into the theory and then everything is going to be okay. Uh, and I think that's uh, not correct. So I'm going to argue instead that it's not only that offspring claim, that measure that's mistaken, but it's also this priority claim, the idea that the fitness of the type can be reduced to the fitnesses of the individuals of the type. Uh, so let me try to uh, persuade you of that. And here I follow Sober. Um, Sober points out that it's an implication of that second fitness measure, which has the population size parameter in it, that you can change the fitness of a type without changing any of the reproductive propensities of the individuals of that type. You do that just by adding other individuals to the population and hence changing the size of the population and hence changing the fitness by lights of this measure. Um, uh, so because you can change the fitness of a type without changing any of the propensities of individuals of that type, the fitness of the type is not a function only of the propensities of the individuals. That's a very straightforward argument. Uh, uh, I think that argument is correct, basically. What I want to do is to defend various things that people have said about that argument to try and uh, ward off the claim that priority is false. Um, even Sober himself uh, uh, accepts priority for reasons I'll explain. Uh, so the first objection is to say, look, um, this parameter population size uh, must make a difference to the reproductive propensities of individuals because of the conditions required for these individuals to be members of populations in the first place. So Roberta Milstein says, uh, Look, uh, in order to be a member of a population, you have to have causal interactions with the other individuals in the population. Um, uh, hence, this population size does make a difference to the propensities of individuals. And I think the problem with that response is that it doesn't follow from the fact that you need to causally interact with other individuals in your population in order to be members of the population. That uh, the uh, propensities to, to reproduce of the individuals are affected by population size. I mean, th those are two different claims, and the one doesn't follow from the other. Uh, second objection uh, made by a, a paper with uh, lots of philosophers on it, uh, Otsuka is the first author. Uh, these authors say, look, this, this um, me fitness measure with N in it is biologically very unusual. Biologists never use it. And in fact, there's a generalization of the measure in which it doesn't appear. And so this is a kind of red herring. Um, and my reply to that is that it is true that there's a generalization of the measure in which N doesn't appear. And I'll, I'll just describe what that generalization is for a moment. Um, the generalization is one which sees the two cases I presented, the case of um, between generation variance and within generation variance, as being two ends of a spectrum. Uh, on one end of the spectrum is the case where the reproductive output of the type is perfectly correlated. That's where you get between generation variance. And on the other end is the case where there's no correlation at all between the individual's reproductive output. That's the case where you get uh, what I called earlier within generation variance. Uh, but there's a sort of spectrum between those cases where you get correlations of various strengths between the reproductive output of individuals. 
And when you build a model in which you allow that there can be these intermediate cases, right? Cases where knowing that type B had three offspring gives you some information about whether other individuals of type B will have that many offspring, but not perfect information, right? Um, you write down the measure for fitness for those cases, what you see is that the fitness of the type is a function of the expected offspring number, the frequency of the type in the population, uh, the correlation of reproductive output for that type, that's the rho i in this expression, and the variance. So effectively, uh, in, in the generalized model, you've got this parameter correlations between reproductive success that's playing the role that N played in the Gillespie model. And the basic observation I want to make about that is that just as population size can be changed without changing any reproductive propensities of any individuals in the population, so the correlation, between re the correlation in reproductive success for a type can be uh, uh, changed without changing the reproductive propensities of any individuals in the population, right? If I just introduce many more individuals that are reproducing in phase with the individuals I already have, then I can change the correlation in reproductive output without having changed the reproductive propensities of any of the individuals in the population. Uh, it's the correlation of, it's the correlation between reproductive output of individuals of that type in the population. Yeah. Yeah. You can think of it as like if I if I randomly s no, because it's the correlation between reproductive output. Oh, sorry. Yeah, QI is the frequency of the individuals in the population, and rho i is the correlation. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The problem is that there's a could be a population and um, a, a population that contains that population and the fitness of the, the subpopulation um, is would be the same in the so the fitness of the um, individuals in, this, in the big population will be bigger than the different from the different, different yeah different. but it doesn't that doesn't show that it doesn't that the fitness doesn't supervene on the totality of the fitnesses of the um, members of the population. That's right. Can you hold that thought and I'll come back to it as I go along. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me think about what this, uh, I'll say something I think I'll say something a little later that bears on that point. Uh, okay, let me move on to the next objection. Uh, so Sober says, uh, look, we don't have to give up on priority just because of these uh, fitness measures that contain uh, the population size. Uh, uh, one thing you can do is allow that the fitness of individuals in the population depends on that parameter, just as the fitness of the type in the population depends on that parameter. So the, the strategy here is to say, okay, um, let's accept that the Gillespie measure that includes population size is correct for the type. We can still preserve the idea that the fitness of the type is the average of the fitnesses of the individuals if we allow the fitnesses of the individuals to also be influenced by the, by the population size. And what I want to say about that is that you're introducing this parameter for individual fitnesses that makes no difference to the expected reproductive output of the individuals. I mean, you can put it in there as a correcting factor to ensure that you get the average. Uh, but uh, I think we should preserve the connection between assigning fitness to something and having that quantity predict reproductive output. And so we shouldn't include N in that measure. Yeah. When you're talking about uh, the fitness of a type, should you be thinking of like, the fitness of a species or a specific population um, that falls under the heading? Because if it's, if it's a species, then I would think that like, actual uh, specific population that we're considering or altering 
uh, should have you know, some direct effect on the fitness of the type, but if it is specific to a population, then, uh, yeah, then the actual members that are out there in the world here. So, so we're not talking about the we're not talking about the fitness of a species. We're talking about the fitness. So we're just talking about populations of individuals that bear traits, yeah. so that fall under types. And when we're talking about the fitness of the, of the type, we're talking about uh, some quantity that predicts how the frequency of that type will change through time. All right, so we're, that's okay. what we're talking about. So we're talking about individuals. They might be individuals that typically will be individuals of the same species that we're asking how do different individuals of that species that have different um, values of traits change in frequency through time. Yeah. Yeah. So I keep trying to hold on to the little shred from previous learning about this topic and definition of what's a doctor. So one thing, one thing that comes to my mind is all these examples where the, the size of the population is relevant to mm -hmm. reproduction success of yeah. individuals because when there's too many, they don't have anyone to eat. Yeah. So I don't understand. Yeah, that's right. So, so what I'm saying, I mean, and I, I'm going to come back to this a little later as well. Uh, what I think is that the role of population size can be either causal or non-causal. So there are cases, of course, where the, the population size makes a difference to how likely it is that particular individuals in the population succeed and reproduce, right? They might be fighting for resources, for example, so the size of the population induces more competition for resources, so less of a chance that you can, that you can survive and reproduce. So I'm not denying that, th that there are cases of that kind. What I am denying is that uh, the, the measure of fitness that Gillespie has written down for cases involving variants uh, within generation necessarily are cases of that kind. The, ro the, re the explanation for why population size appears in this measure of fitness hasn't got to do with the fact that the reproductive dispositions of any individuals are being changed. Uh, it has to do instead with uh, something more like the law of large numbers. Th think about it this way. Uh, the, why, why is n appearing in this uh, model in the first place? Well, it's because the, when you have individuals that can vary among themselves in their reproductive output, um, the larger the population, the more likely it is that the, uh, the actual total number that the individuals of that type will produce converges on the expected value. But the smaller the population, the more likely it is that there's going to be spread around the expected value. So it's a kind of case um, uh, in, in fitness that's analogous to what goes on in cases of genetic drift, where smaller population sizes lead to more randomness in evolution, and larger population sizes lead to less randomness in evolution. Right? So that's, that's why the, the, the n parameter is getting in there, because the, the uh, the larger the population, the more likely it is that the, that the individuals of that type are going to contribute something that's clustered around the average, whereas the, the, the smaller the population, the more likely it is that you're going to get that between-generation variance that makes for the differences in expected frequency. Right? And you, so, you, so my point is you're going to get that statistical effect. Well, actually, I think, I, think uh, I mean, one of the things, I actually don't think, I mean, I could defend it by saying it's philosophy and we're interested in all of the possible situations. But I actually think in this case that it's not unrealistic to suppose that there are populations where there isn't the kind of density-dependent selection that you were describing 
but in which the size of the population does make a difference because of the point I was making. But when you began with a definition that had a dependence on the environment. Yeah. Uh, and we, but once that was said, it wasn't repeated. So right. We were holding that fixed in the background. And yet, yeah. and yet the environment is so fluctuating in uh, any kind of real situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's a problem for people who are actually trying to measure these quantities in natural populations, right? Uh, and it, you know, that is difficult. But it, that, that is certainly independent of, of both what I'm doing, but also of what population geneticists are doing when they write down these models. Because what they're doing is uh, assuming reproductive um, dispositions of a certain kind and then trying to calculate fitness parameters with respect to those dispositions. And they, like, like I am doing, are assuming that those things are constant through time, at least in, in a large range of the models that they're specifying. I mean, I agree with you that one consequence of that is that it may be that the models are all too idealized to be applicable to lots of real world cases. Um, that's, that's a problem not just for me, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This slide kind of makes it very prominent in my OK, let me, let me go on. I, I want to talk about a fourth objection that might be made to the argument that I gave following SOBA. Uh, another thing you might say is that, look, um, this uh, measure that includes n as a parameter is a, is a measure of relative fitness. Uh, and that's true. And it's old news that relative fitness depends on frequency. Uh, and I'll explain in a moment why that is. Moreover, frequency, like population size, is irrelevant to the reproductive success of individuals, uh, or at least it may be irrelevant. Hence, if the argument works, it works against any relevant fitness measure. So that's a kind of reductio of the argument I made. So let, let me explain uh, why it is that relative fitness depends on uh, frequency. Um, the expression there is a very simple expression for the fitness of a type as a function or relative fitness of a type as a function of its reproductive output in relation to the reproductive output of the alternative type in the population. So uh, it's saying the relative fitness is equivalent to the ratio of the reproductive output of that type to the average reproductive output in the population. Right? That's why it's a normalized measure of fitness or a relative measure of fitness. But of course, the, the um, Average reproductive output in the population is a function of the frequency of the types, right? It's the sum of the, the frequency of type 1 multiplied by its reproductive output and the, reprodu and the frequency of the alternative type and its reproductive output. Um, and so relative fitness is a measure of fitness that is sensitive to frequency. Uh, and that's just, a, that's just a kind of mathematical fact. It's a fact about the definition of relative fitness. Um, just to illustrate it, this is a sort of graph that is just a graph of the relationship between reproductive output and relative fitness for different frequencies of the type in the population. So you can see that um, you know, the, the yellow curve is uh, the way in which fitness changes with changes in reproductive output for a type that's at 90% in the population. The, the blue line is, is, a, is a graph of the way that fitness changes as a function of reproductive success for a, for a rare type in the population. Um, uh, and just like what I said earlier about population size, this is just a mathematical fact about the way that fitness is defined. Uh, it's, it's not that these frequencies are making some causal impact on the propensities of the individuals to reproduce. It's, this is just a function of the way that we're normalizing um, fitness with respect to average fitness in the population. Uh, so what do I say to that? Uh, I think the cases are disanalogous uh, for the following uh, reason. Um, this dependence of fitness on frequency that I just introduced can be derived by, uh, you can reach it by uh, doing the following, as the defenders of the propensity interpretation suggest. You can first calculate the absolute fitness of one type, and then calculate the absolute fitness of another type, uh, and then, uh, of all of the individuals, sorry. 
and then you can get the absolute fitness of types as a function of the absolute fitnesses of the individuals. And then you can normalize, which is going to give you your relative fitness measures. So th there's a way of calculating where you start with these individual fitnesses and end up with these normalized measures. Uh, but you can't do that with respect to population size or, or correlation. That is, you can't um, first calculate the fitnesses of, and this is where I'm coming back to the point that um, you made earlier, Barry. You can't start with the individual fitnesses and then calculate from those the fitnesses of the, the two types and then combine them to reach a measure of the relative fitness of the types because there's this factor that makes a difference to the fitness of the type, namely correlation, which isn't going to be recovered from just starting with those individual fitness measures. Because those correlations don't make a difference to the reproductive outputs of any of the individuals in the population. right? So they're not going to be incorporated into those individual level measures that do predict reproductive outputs of individuals. Right? So there's this extra thing that makes a difference to the fitness of the type that is not contained in the fitnesses of the individuals. Um, so while it's true that uh, there's a dependence of relative fitness in general on uh, frequency, um, that's compatible with the truth of priority in a way that these um, fitness measures that involve correlations is not compatible with the, with the truth of priority, or so, so I claim. Uh, okay, so an upshot of that is that there are actually, and this is coming back to the point about um, population size, an upshot of this is that there are actually, I, th I think, three different ways in which global features of a population, like frequency or population size, can make an impact on fitness. One way that it can happen is in the way that you were suggesting. It can be that there's um, some feature of the population makes a causal impact on how well the individuals do in the population. So that's a causal impact, and it makes a difference to individual level fitnesses. Um, so for example, it may induce competition for resources or mates or something like that. But a second way it can do it is the way I just described um, for relative fitness measures, which is that the dependence may be sort of purely mathematical in origin. It may be to do with the fact that we're normalizing our fitness measure with respect to the fitnesses of other types in the population. Um, but in such a way that it's compatible with the idea that all fitnesses come from individual fitnesses, compatible with priority. But finally, and this is what I claim is the case for um, these cases involving variants, it may be that the dependence is not causal and also not grounded in the individual fitnesses. So the explanation for why it is that this global feature makes a difference to fitness um, is, is of a purely mathematical character. It's to do with the, the law of large numbers, basically. Um, uh, and it's not because that makes a difference to individual level fitnesses. Uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, conflation of these things in the literature, as in the biological literature uh, also. So for example, when uh, in the generalized uh, measure of fitness that introduced this notion of correlation and then you derive the Gillespie measures as limiting cases, uh, that's by a biologist called Stephen Frank. And throughout that paper, he calls this effect uh, density-dependent selection. And that term, density-dependent selection, is a term that's used in biology primarily to refer to phenomena via which um, population size makes a difference to the behaviors of individuals. Right? So he's using a term that's well established for making a causal difference on individual fitness to describe a phenomena that, as I've argued, has nothing to do with making a causal difference to individual level fitnesses. Uh, OK, uh, so to conclude, so what I've argued is that uh, these cases involving variants entail that uh, not only that this measure of uh, fitness of the propensity interpretation is false, but also this claim of priority, this relationship between type fitnesses and individual level fitnesses is false. Uh, for all that, it may be that there is a uniform measure of fitness, and it may be that fitness is a propensity, right? So it may be that there's a single measure of fitness that applies both to individuals and to types, and that uh, uh, describes some kind of propensity of those things to lead to uh, reproductive output of a certain character. 
uh, all I've denied is that there, there's a particular relationship between the fitnesses of individuals and the fitnesses of types. And to put the argument even more generally, what I've, if I've persuaded you of one thing, I, I hope to have persuaded you that the following three claims are inconsistent with each other. You can't believe all three at the same, same time. First of all, that the individual fitness is this quantity that predicts, its theoretical role is to predict offspring number of individuals. And likewise, that the theoretical role of the fitness of types is to predict the, the uh, offspring number of that type in a population. And third of all, that you can reduce type fitnesses to individual level fitnesses. Now, my preferred option, I mean, these three are inconsistent, I've argued. Uh, what I've suggested is that uh, we should reject three and I think we should reject three rather than one or two because it seems to me a kind of uh, almost a kind of conceptual truth about the role of fitness in biology that its role is to predict offspring number, right? And so if you try to save three, you're going to end up with this thing you're calling fitness that doesn't have to do with predicting offspring number. Um, so that, that's why I think we should uh, reject three and, and retain one and two. Uh, but for all I've argued, maybe, maybe you'd prefer to take a different option, as Sober does, for example. Uh, and I'll stop there and maybe have some discussion. Thank you.